it's very nice that there isn't any program printed, so there's no end time for my talk uh, <laughs> schedule. So, uh, uh, I guess it's very uh, there's an emotional fact for many of us to you know meet uh, today after these couple of years and this postponed two two years. Uh, so uh, certainly. Uh, a very uh, special feeling to, for me, I'm in the privileged position of seeing you all and uh, to uh, see all these uh, nice friendly faces uh, and clever minds, uh, well I know clever minds uh, behind those uh, friendly faces and uh, it's good to be, to be uh, uh, together again. This conference, uh, I mean the, I guess the practical reason for which I'm the first speaker is because uh, because of conflicting schedules I'll have to leave pretty early the conference so we're kind enough to put me as the first speaker it's not because my talk has any any special uh, 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 significance but nevertheless now that I'm the first one uh, I just want to say that uh, I view this conference as also a way to many of the younger people that I see or that I have been, uh, you know, seeing uh, in the, the uh, in my classes or wherever at some point in there interacted in some point or any you know, the younger generation <coughs> to meet a substantial uh, fraction of all the heroes that, you know, have built uh, uh, along the years, uh, you know, this uh, wonderful subject and uh, have brought in so many, so many ideas um, uh, and have, uh, you know, the easing model is one aspect of it, but have constructed a whole uh, community of mathematical physics uh, around it and uh, made this community also into what it is, which is a nice place to work and do uh, uh, science. Also, with sort of this uh, aspect, which maybe has been lost by some of us, uh, including myself, the, this idea that the motivations come from real physics and uh, with an understanding of what physics uh, is about. And, uh, and uh, then, you know, we, myself, maybe, you know, I'm more focused on the, the you know, mathematical uh, things and mathematical objects themselves, maybe forgetting about, you know, where it all comes from. And uh, so I just encourage everyone to uh, interact as much as you can to, you know, extract as much information of these, uh, all these wonderful people we have here. And it's uh, uh, always very uh, 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 I always feel like, you know, a little child when I have to, to uh, uh, explain something on these topics. Uh, to this mathematical physics crowd. Now, um, what <coughs> the concrete uh, topic, what I'm, I thought sort of my mission here was to try to give you a bit of an overview, state of the art of what on the side of uh, SLE, conformal loop ensemble, uh, random, you know, concrete random uh, geometric objects, um, uh, what has been going on maybe in the last uh, ten, 10 years or, or so, or a fraction of what's been going on, but sample uh, sample some of them, and also explain you where things stand now. Um, and so that will be somehow the on the continuum side. So I won't be starting with the lattice and trying to understand, you know, build, look at the easing model itself, but look at the continuum, uh, you know, what is supposed to be or proved to be the, the continuum scaling limit. And in terms of geometric, random geometric objects, in the way you know that has been initiated by Odette Schramm and uh, when he introduced the schramm levin evolution. Um, so, if you come from theoretical physics, you could say uh, you know that's going to be a description of you know, the alternative uh, random geometric object description of the conformal field theories that are describing these uh, uh, <coughs> scaling limits of the easy model. I want to emphasize a few things. Uh, I will be specifically speaking about the easing model, but actually everything I'm going to tell has a version or a variation that uh, has to do with the 
cousins of the Ising model, like the POTS models or uh, random cluster models of various kinds. And the other thing is, um, I will not try to, you know, uh, be extremely, uh, you know, uh, quote exactly all the references and all the maybe I will omit some names uh, by mistake, uh, because otherwise I will just uh, spend the time, or, you know, uh, listing a contribution of the various people, and time will run out even faster than it is already now. Um, the yes. So maybe I should just uh, 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 start immediately. So maybe the starting point, nevertheless, I want to uh, remind you of is that when you are studying the Ising model on the discrete graph, you have these two ways to, uh, uh, to, to look at them. Uh, the first one is, you know, you have some discrete graph and, and the Ising model is about, uh, you know, having a spin at each point. So you have this, thing that uh, each site, you know, is uh, either a plus or a minus. Or maybe I'll use a color just to uh, here. So that would be the easy model. And then the question is, you know, if you are, what are you interested in the physics, in the easy model motivated by ferromagnetism or things like that? Uh, you might be interested in the global magnetization of or, or, or these things. And then it turns out that, you know, a convenient uh, other model that you like to look at is this fortune castellane uh, model uh, or random cluster models, where uh, instead of having something where you have something random at points, you, you know, you're looking at a variation of bond percolation where, you know, edges are open or closed uh, on the graph. Right, so that's the FK percolation. And as we know from Fortune and Castellane and then uh, Edward Sockel, uh, so-called Edward Sockel coupling, you can, you know, there's a nice way to go from one to the other, which is that if you start with the FK percolation associated to the Ising model, and for each cluster you decide to toss a coin to correlate in, I mean, to decide if the, this cluster is all blue, uh, is all uh, plus or all minus, independently for all the clusters, then you get a, uh, the Ising model, and conversely, if you start from the Ising model and you have this graph with the edges here in between, uh, if you do sort of critical percolation inside each of, I mean, so percolation inside each of the uh, plus or minus clusters, then you end up with the uh, FK uh, model on the other side. And so, as Fortune Castellane, uh, you know, uh, uh, explained us already in, in, in the early days, um, if you're looking at something having to do with the global magnetization, so, you know, the sum of the, the spins here, uh, then actually uh, this is going to be related to the geometry of the FK clusters. Right? So in some sense, the geometry of the plus or minus clusters in the Ising model are not really important. What is important in terms of the geometry has to do with uh, what happens on this side and, you know, the, the, the simple, you know, uh, thing you can write. The, the simplest way to look at it is just to say, you know, if, we, if you do something like uh, take the expected value of the square of uh, the global magnetization, you just get the sum, you know, you expand the sum of x of y of uh, here on this side, the probability that x is connected to y in the FK recommendation. And therefore, uh, somehow the, the, the geometry of the FK percolation description encodes, you know, the moments uh, of this global magnetization. So that was just a, you know, little uh, starting point to say that looking at, you know, these random geometric objects, which are the clusters over there, gives some insight also in sort of maybe more physical, you know, physically relevant object like magnetization that you want to look at. Now, we can keep that in the back of our mind. And so what I just want to tell you now is that on the continuum side, uh, we have these objects now that we like to call, or that uh, Scott Sheffield called the conformal loop ensembles. And 
as for all these terms that you know mathematicians have been uh, using in the last 20 years after SLE showed up, I'm sure you know from a physics perspective it might be very poor, poor choices because they might uh, you know induce uh, wrong interpretations, uh, right? Loop ensembles. So these loop ensembles, of course, the the main reason for for choosing this acronym was that uh, you know. It's CLE sounds like SLE, and uh, therefore it's a cousin of SLE, but otherwise I'm... Anyway, so these conformal loop ensembles are essentially uh, the geometric picture that are supposed to describe, or are describing in the case of the Ising model, because we, this is something one can prove, the scaling limit, the joint picture of the scaling limit of uh, all the collection of you know, all the information coming from all the interfaces in both uh, these two models there. So uh, maybe I will start with the, with the easing model one, which is this so-called CLE3. And uh, so, so if you take, your, if you take a, a domain, in a simply connected domain in the plane D, a conformal loop ensemble is just going to be a collection of simple non-overlapping loops. So therefore, you know, it's an ensemble of loops where they're interacting in very much in the sense they're not uh, overlapping. So it's not just a... Yeah. So it's a picture like that. And you can actually continue here, like in here. So in some sense, for if you come from physics, pers physics perspective and you know the ON model, you know, you could say this would be the scaling limit of the O1 model. If you work on the you know, on the hexagonal lattice, so it's a, it's this collection of loops, and as I'll describe to you, we sort of know just by uh, uh, you know you can write a theorem saying there exists a unique random collection of loops with certain properties, which are the properties you would expect from a conformally invariant scaling limit of the Ising model. Right, so in some sense, uh, I'm going to, to make that maybe a, a bit clearer, but sort of, you know, there are, you, we know that, you know, if the scaling limit of the Ising model interfaces uh, in two dimensions, critical Ising model interfaces in two dimensions is conform invariant, then there's no other choice than this particular random collection of loops that we call CLE3. And let me just, you know, say a few properties, uh, list a few properties of this CLE3, and the, the general picture is that we know, you know, all the qualitative and quantitative descriptions of this object we have information about. So, you know, these curves, we know the dimension of these curves, we know the dimensions of these, uh, you know, of these fractal sets, these connected components that are separated by these uh, objects here. And the way you should think about this CLE3 is that if you come, you know, if you start from an easing model with plus boundary conditions in that domain, you can look at the plus cluster that touches the boundary, right? And it will have holes that are, you know, when you have plus minus here, it will have holes which will be, you know, themselves easing clusters with minus boundary conditions. And so this, you know, outermost fractal set, random fractal set that you see here is sort of the scaling limit of the plus cluster of an easing with plus boundary conditions. Now, the, the way, uh, the properties that, you know, this thing has and that actually does characterize it, and I want to, you know, say a few words about it. The first property is, well, you want this to be conform invariant. So that means that this, so in particular, if I fix this domain D and I fix any conformal map from D onto itself, which is fixed, then the law of the picture and the law of the image of this picture under this conformal map are identical. Right? So the, it sort of uh, has this conformal invariance and therefore, because you know if it's invariant under any conformal transformation of the one domain into itself, it will be invariant also 
you know, you can define it in any other domain or any other domain by a conformal invariance. So if I want to define this in the square rather than in this potato, I take this random object in this potato and map it conformally into the square and I get the random picture in the square. So it is conformal invariant. It has it inherits something that comes from the nearest neighbor property of the Ising model. And so this is what you can view as this conformal Markov property, which is that uh, sort of which is essentially that if you decide to cut out some part of your domain here, and you look at this random object here, I take only the outermost loops here. So you cut this out, right? So now you have a plus boundary condition. You want to take this as plus boundary conditions here. And now what you're going to do is you're going to travel here. And as soon as you see one loop that intersects the boundary, you go around it, right? So now you have a new domain. I'm going to do red here, like that. So you discover the loop that intersects you know, this thing. And now you go around it. Now you have a new domain of unexplored loops, which are on the right-hand side of this. And the condition will be, well, this random collection of loops that lies on this side will be, well, you, you know, if you think of it as the scaling of easing with plus boundary conditions, well, it will have plus boundary conditions everywhere because you go around all these interfaces. And therefore, the law of what you have to explore here has to be the same as what you started with, namely a conformal loop ensemble in this new domain. And the law of this conformal new ensemble in this random new domain is the same as the conformal image of the previous one. Okay, so that's just this uh, combination of nearest neighbor interaction type thing plus, uh, well, conformal invariance itself. But does those two properties then uniquely define this? Well, uh, this, this uniquely, so that's one of the main results of our you know, paper with Scott Sheffield in 2000, around 2012, I think. It uniquely characterizes a one-parameter family of loop objects, which are basically all the possible scaling limits of the ON model. Then to say which one is the one corresponding to easing, well, there, there is a, so in a paper with a, Jason Miller, we sort of explained something like that, which is like, I look, imagine, and that's a very important, uh, you know, uh, for anybody, you know, doing these probabilistic things. Uh, it's a very important uh, concept uh, to use, is that this idea, you, you start from a boundary point here, and you try to start exploring, you're discovering the loop ensemble as you travel. So one way to do is, you know, you start going inside and I'd go a loop and you discover the loop, you go around the loop, you finish the loop and then you continue to discover a new loop, you start going around this other loop. So what you can do is the following, I start discovering my loop ensemble like that and here I stop in the middle of discovering this loop. Yes? So we are always at the critical That's th Yes. Does it... If you look at this, does it also enable you to sort of understand what happens when you leave the critical temp? Well, it's the usual thing, which is that, you know, this is conformal invariance. So, of course, this is specific to the critical temperature because if you're near critical, you, you, know, you lose some of it. So, of course, it will tell you, you know, then you have the near, you know, these uh, scaling type things that says, understanding what happens exactly at the critical temperature, if you look at it correctly, will enable you to understand how you get away from it and sort of some exponents there, but that's, right. I'll come. So here I start discovering half of, of this loop. I haven't finished and I do the same from the other side. So if you do that, it can happen that you have started discovering this here and started discovering that here so now you have special marked points, right? The boundary conditions are, you know, uh, they, they are plus everywhere, but they are minus on the red, in, in the inside uh, red thing. So you could decide to stop exploring where, conformally speaking, you're looking at something which looks like a square. You can always do that. Well, if it was the easing model that you're talking about, then 
if you start discovering these on both sides, what is the conditional probability now that these two parts are in the same loop or not? Meaning that they will hook up like that. It's going to be one half. Right? So CLE3, which is this one, is the unique CLE with this property that when you start discovering this thing and you're looking at the square picture, the probability to, that these two loops are in the same is one half. Right, so it's a completely just completely everything in the continuum description. So this, this, and this, which is the characterization of this of this ensemble of loops, is uh, look everything happens in the continuum. There's no reference to any uh, uh, discrete uh, model or discrete conformal invariance. It's just a, a story about random continuum objects. And okay, well, uh, since the question was asked, you know, we have this one parameter family of objects there. And then here, you know, if it was a, a ON model, then, you know, the number of loops will be weighted by N to the power number of loops. And therefore, you would have a weighting, uh, you know, uh, uh, the N, the 1 over 1 plus N would be, you know, the probability of connecting here that would be corresponding to the possible scaling limit of the corresponding ON model. Anyway, but I don't want to... Right, so you have this, uh, uh, and I guess this story here... Uh, Evelina might uh, say, you know, go into further in this type of direction. When you explore the, these loops, what is the criterion to jump over from one loop to the next? Well, that's, that's a, a very important object here. In, I mean, the concept, what I said, was had to do with these sort of, you want to do, explore the loops in any way you like, but you have to do it locally. So, you know, it's... But I'm going to come back that to maybe in a moment when we'll describing the scaling limit of the edward sockel coupling because you know the loops there are holes between the loops right sort of you feel there are holes but actually there are no holes because it's a fractal object so you know you, you can decide any little rule to try to drill uh, so you know one way would be just to say well let's go always straight uh -huh. i continue you know drilling straight as from the furthest point i am uh, in the previously discovered loop or that's uh, all right so, but that's just a, yeah. Can you do jumps? Uh, is it allowed to have jumps? Well, as long as you could do jumps on the, I mean, okay. Uh, you can't jump to the inside. You always have to explore from the outside. I mean, the, the basic picture is the following. You're, you're at kindergarten. You're given this shape with these holes and scissors, right? And then you're, you're allowed to cut from the, from the outside into these uh, holes. But you, you know, scissors, you're only allowed to cut from the outside and then if you discover a hole then you, you can cut from wherever you are inside the hole uh, from there. anyway so that's the, the the story here and there is a similar story uh, so as I said uh, I'm going to you know say uh, come back to that in a moment but you know we know the dim fractal dimensions of these objects here and we know the fractal dimension of this object here. So in the case of the easing model, you know, this is going to be a SLE three type curve. So, it's a, so it's good. these curves are going to be fractal. And, uh, you know, this is a characterization of this. But then with this completely, you know, abstract characterization with any assumption, but then you know that the dimension of these, uh, of the clusters are going to be uh, 2 minus 5 over 96, if I'm not mistaken. And that the dimension here of the loops will be, uh, well, uh, I have to be careful, well, uh, let me just write it like that. Of course, uh, you know, this type of thing might be wrong as soon as I start writing, uh, adding two numbers and uh, I'm going to get it wrong. All right. Yeah. I, I missed the point. In the exploration, do you start from a point which corresponds to changing the boundary conditions? And no, it's, it's, it's just, the, the way it goes is that you are somewhere, I mean, there's the idea you are somewhere with plus boundary conditions. Everywhere. Everywhere. And then sort of a microscopic level, you're seeing, you know, you're drilling something like inside this plus boundary conditions. And then if you discover a minus, then you have an interface and then you want to discover this interface. So, but, but this interface might disappear very quickly and then you just continue until, you know, at macroscopic level, you are going to suddenly start seeing the big ones. 
But uh, so the where you start exploring is just deciding where you start cutting to see if you start discovering minuses. The important thing is if you start discovering an interface, you have to you know, continue discovering. OK, so I want to, to make two comments that will resonate uh, to quite a few of you, I'm sure. Uh, Michael, certainly, which is, uh, and yeah, uh, Jörg and Tom, and, uh, which is that um, in order to construct this object that satisfies these property, in particular the conformal Markov property, uh, the, the conformal invariance property, sort of the basically almost only tool we have is to use another collection of loops, which are these, what we like to call these, uh, uh, we called uh, loop soup, uh, because I, we like the term, but of course, uh, you know, then a bit later we said, okay, well, uh, these objects are hidden in the Freudish Spen Bridges, Freudish Spencer uh, combinatorial tricks on the discrete side. Uh, <laughs> and when physicists talk about grand canonical ensemble, actually, you know, probabilists would say they mean the Poisson collection of random objects, you know, I mean, so these things were somewhere, you know, hidden, not as ge random geometric objects, but they were, you know, all over the place since the work of Semantic, at least uh, in, in the beginning of quantum field theory, which is this random collection of Brownian loops that's, you know, the natural <coughs> random collection of Brownian loops that you that rain and fall down here. And I'm not going to describe to you how, by looking at the clusters of these Brownian loops, you get construct these uh, objects here. That's the content of the paper with Scott. But I just want to emphasize one thing, is that out of that comes the fact that if you couple, that there's a very natural coupling between two independent easing models, or between, between two independent CLE3s, and the Gaussian free field. So in some sense, there's a very natural way to say that, you know, the Gaussian free field is, is constructed, can be constructed out of a cloud of overlapping loops, independent overlapping Brownian loops. And the easing model can be constructed out of a cloud of overlapping loops with, with half the density of these loops. So if you have two independent easing models, you put them on top of each other, you get exactly something having to do with the Gaussian free field. So of course, this will resonate, you know, with the number of things that happened in or some of the clever brains uh, in the audience here. So what I want to say is that if I take two CLE3 like this, independent ones, so now you you know these in the loops will start overlapping, and then you look at the the holes created by the union of these two holes, then these are the holes that are naturally embedded in a Gaussian free field. Okay, level lines of the Gaussian free field. So this is really you. In this continuum setting, you have this direct, you know, uh, dictionary between these random geometric objects. So that was one comment I wanted to make. Now the other, uh, now comes the, the scaling limit of the FK percolation model, which I said was more relevant to study the magnetization of the easing model. So here, the picture is very different because you're looking at a model which is a cousin of Bernoulli percolation. So the loops would be, you know, the outer boundary and inner boundary of these clusters. Uh, and they touch each other. So, you know, the picture would not be at all like that. It would be a picture, uh, you know, with lots of loops. Uh, you know, I, I'm showing them in different colors, but otherwise one doesn't see anything, you know, of, of uh, the loops that correspond to the outer and inner boundary of the FK percolation clusters scaling limits. So again, there is some not exactly the same, uh, but there is some, uh, you know, uh, abstract characterization that tells you that there exists a unique collection of loops, which is called the CLE 16 over 3. There exists a unique collection of non-simple touching loops, which uh, is conformally invariant and has, uh, well, you know, this property, one has to be a bit careful, but sort of uh, in some sense, uh, which has a, you know, a, some sort of a property that uh, is inherited from the nearest neighbor interaction in the FK easing, uh, FK easing model. And that has the property, now this time, so if I discover, you know, this FK thing from here, I discover a loop here halfway, and I discover an FK loop here halfway, I still have this sort of, a, I can still map this, 
you know, do the exploration until I have a square. And this time, for this one, if you want this to be the scaling limit of the FK percolation model, because you weight differently, you know, the, 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 the weight is just according to the number of clusters. So depending if the hookup is like this or like that, or, you know, the other way, there will be a factor two in the weight in the discrete model. Uh, so therefore, in that case, the probability, you know, this, the hookup probabilities for this object is going to be two thirds, one third. The only way to have a one twice the other one. Uh, and so again, you know, you can show there exists a unique collection of you know, overlapping, you know, I mean, uh, you know, non non-self-crossing or non-crossing but still touching loops, uh, which has all the properties you would expect from the scaling of the FK2 uh, percolation uh, scaling limit, which is this uh, CLE 16 over 3, and it's the only one which has this hookup probability, which is the one you would expect from the scaling limit over there. Okay, so that's, uh, again, you know, we know, you know, the dimension of this object, uh, which I think, I mean, you know, we, the dimension of the, both the curve and sort of, you know, the, the fractal set, which would correspond to the scaling, you know, which is the scaling limit of the um, FK clusters themselves, which then in that case, if I'm not mistaken, would be 15 over 8 would be the dimension uh, over here. So, of course, this 15 over 8, now, you know, this is 2 minus 1, 8, and this is the 1, 8 uh, that, uh, you know, uh, has been found at least 70 years ago now by, uh, um, yeah, uh, in, the, in the physics literature on the discrete models. So, so that's sort of the, the picture that we know, you know, there are construction, and, and I want to emphasize that this construction of this object, the constructions of these two things, they look very similar, but they have a very different flavor. Uh, and so from a mathematical perspective, this, the trick here is to use these loop soups. And here the trick is you really have to use this, uh, want to prove something about SLEs being reversible. And there you have to go through four, the four papers of uh, Scott Sheffield and Jason Miller called Imaginary Geometry that use, uh, you know, build on the coupling between uh, um, uh, the Gaussian free field and SLE models in order to uh, uh, show that this family of loop that one can construct is indeed a conforming variant. That doesn't, you know, there's always the problem of you can define a family of loops if you choose a starting point in an algorithm of how to discover things, but then to show that this is not, does not depend on the starting point you chose is actually uh, an issue. Anyway, so that was just uh, this one. So then, once you are there, you can prove on this a number of things, uh, or you can try to prove a number of things, and one thing you might want to do is say, well, you, these two are obviously related, because on the discrete level, I told you that if you start from the FK2 percolation object and you toss in independent coins for, for each of the clusters to decide if it's a plus or a minus, the coloring you get has the law of the easing model. Conversely, if I start from the easing model and I do an independent FK uh, in a sort of percolation inside the clusters, uh, I might come back to the FK model. So, so this is something uh, which we proved hold in this model. So this is this sort of CLE percolation story. So just to So that's a paper, I think, uh, 2017 with Jason Miller and uh, Scott Sheffield, where we proved that uh, basically, indeed, uh, if you start from CLE 16 over 3 plus independent coins for each cluster defined in the CLE 16 over 3, then you get, you can construct a CLE 3. Okay, so you do this independent coloring, red and blue, uh, if depending on, on, on for each of the FK clusters. You first, some, so you do exactly the same story as in the discrete case, going from FK to easing. This works, and similarly, uh, if I start from CLE three cluster, so you start with one of these fractal sets of dimension uh, 
2 minus 5 over 96. And then you defined, you know, you have some uh, axiomatic description of what would be critical percolation in this cluster. So you, you define some axioms that says, you know, something would be illicit, uh, conf, you know, percolation within this cluster if it satisfies these and those properties. And then you show as well, there's just only one way to do it. This exists. And the objects you construct in this way is CLE 16 over 3. So, you know, you, uh, percolation inside each CLE 3 cluster gives CLE 16 over 3. And here, one main tool to, you know, couple these two things together uh, has to do with, uh, is, you know, one of the main tool is this imaginary geometry uh, story because both objects here, this one and that one, can be coupled uh, with the same Gaussian free field and then you can, you know, view them as something defined as level lines, uh, you know, cousins of level lines of the same Gaussian free field and therefore in that coupling you can try to say something. All right, so that's the, the, the CLE percolation uh, story. Uh, uh, so, in particular, uh, what you see here is that um, I just want to, to emphasize one little thing that has to do with the magnetization of the, the easing model that, you know, this all the scale lim limit of the magnetization as you want to try to, would like to try to define via these uh, CLE objects just to illustrate something. And so, that's, uh, there's a couple of papers uh, by uh, Camia, Garbon, and Newman, uh, who's been devoted to, to, to that story. And um, so here, you know, at first you might say, well, if I want to look at the magnetization, scaling limit of the magnetization, uh, I should look at the easing model object CLE3 here. Right? You say, well, I take the number of, you know, how heavy is the plus cluster, and then the next how heavy are the minus clusters. We, you know, you take the plus and the minus the minus, and plus the plus, and minus the minus, and so on. If you do that, you're going to end up with something that is related closely to the dimension of these clusters, which is this uh, thing, which is very close to 2. And by doing that, you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, I just, you know, it's, it's the usual thing. You have infinities that compensate, and you're not doing the right thing. The right thing is really to look at here to say, you know, the, the scaling limit of the magnetization of the easing model would be something where uh, I told you all the clusters of the CLE 16 over 3 are fractal objects of dimension 15 over 8. So there's the thing in, in, uh, in mathematics that if you have a fractal object which is reasonably well behaved, like these random fractals, um, of a certain dimension, you can associate on top of the dimension a number which says that in that dimension, how heavy is that fractal, right? It's a little bit like the constant in front of the, n, the epsilon to the power uh, something that you have in there. So here what you want to do is you do the CLE 16 over 3. You have the collection of clusters that correspond to the scaling limit of the FK percolation clusters. And uh, I call them uh, Ki. These would be the clusters. Then you can describe, you know, in the gauge given by the dimension uh, 15 over 8, uh, each one will have a, you know, a number Ci, which is sort of, you know, the, the 15 8th, in, in 15 8th dimension, the, the weight of each of the clusters. And then you toss a coin for each of those, and you say, well, the sum of the epsilon i ci's, where you sum over all the clusters, where these are iid plus or minus ones, this should be the object that should be the scaling limit of, you know, properly rescaled scaling limit of the magnetization of your thing that you have here. Right? So what you get is that you have these random uh, quantities that you can associate in those things here, which are, uh, yeah? CI is the Hausdorff measure? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is just, yeah. Well, Minkoff, well, okay, this is just, uh, yes. Well, which one is it then? <laughs> Hausdorff measure? Or? I think here you want to have some Minkowski content thing, but uh, okay, I don't want to. Anyway, so, so 
this is sort of the way you want to go about that in these out of these random fractals you can read numbers that you can then interpret as something that uh, would be you know also access the scaling limit of certain uh, objects that you have. Okay, that was just a, a side. Now, the important feature I, I haven't said here is, of course, that, I mean, a first comment is that in all these things, um, you have a, um, uh, okay, I should check my, oh, there is the time. Okay. Uh, that everything I said here, of course, I gave you the picture of the, uh, you know, discrete models in the back of our mind I was referring to, but everything I said here, you know, there's no, at no place where to prove these things I quoted, I said here, you're using anything about the discrete models, right? It's, everything is only in the continuum. We have the axiomatic things, we're looking for a random collection of loops satisfying this and that. We know they exist, they're characterized by these axioms, and then we can uh, study them uh, in detail, and then we can by looking at them in detail, we can sort of recover, you know, lots of these things resonate with uh, what has been going on uh, on the discrete side along uh, you know, many decades of uh, uh, important work. Now, there's the question then, you know, if you want to prove that the discrete models converge to this uh, continuum one, then you have to start working with discrete models, right? So you have to find something and of course, the key is to uh, say, well, there is something reminiscent of conforming variance for these discrete models. And, you know, uh, this has started with, uh, well, Rick, I remember we were here both in Orsay and, uh, uh, you know, saying the conformal invariance of the, the uniform spanning tree. There was actually some discrete conformal invariance going on. And then uh, in the case of the Ising model, then uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, Stas. Uh, proved uh, the conformal invariance of the discrete uh, of, of the Ising model uh, the scaling limit and then if you build on that you know you know you what something is conformal invariance in the discrete case you know what the scaling supposed scaling limit is then you know one should be able to you know, fill the gap and that has been done so basically the global picture is that but that's work that it has to do with the discrete models right uh, which is uh, showing that indeed, you know, uh, all these random geometric objects in the discrete case converge to th these uh, continuum objects, and that um, uh, the you know things that having to do that in this global coupling, you converge to the to 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 this model. So one thing, for instance, that I want to emphasize here is that here I showed you a natural coupling between CLE sixteen over three and CLE three. So you can prove now, and uh, I think that's contained in a paper by Laurent that, uh, and, and Mattis that I will just uh, come back to in a little moment, that you can prove that there's a joint convergence of easing, FK easing, towards this joint coupling of CLE 16 over 3 to CLE over 3. Just one, one thing I just want to emphasize is that, you know, when you want to prove that the discrete models converge to the continuous one, that discrete magnetization converge to discrete magnet, uh, continuous type object, there's always this question of you have to handle both the, you know, uh, microscopic or mes mesoscopic dust, you know, coming from, that disappears in the scaling limit when you look at these other objects, you know, maybe the, the, the main feature in the magnetization comes from uh, you know, the local fluctuation and not uh, of these, you know, uh, other ones. And you want to show that on the continuum side, the dust also uh, is under control. So there's sort of, you know, usual tricks, but that's not, uh, yeah, main. Yeah. So you have mentioned conformal invariance many times, and you said that the easing model is conformal invariant at the critical mm -hmm. point. But there was no mention of minimal models with C equals one half yes. and so on. Is, so, is that connection clear? Or? So here, here the my take is, you know, we started from reading your and all the conformal field theory textbooks and saying, you know, uh, even I think you go on Wikipedia, you probably see, you know, the main thing about the easing model conformal field theory, it is a minimal model. And uh, you know. one comment I wanted to make now is that here, I'd, everything I described to you is specific. I mean, it was in the case of the FK percolation model. But actually, there's a continuum values of these models corresponding to the scaling limit of all the FK models for all the continuum values of Q between one and four, for which you can say something like that. 
So there will be you know, a CLE, a continuum value of CLE things here, even with a non-integer number of colors. And so at no point in everything I said, the fact that it's actually you know, one of these you know, discrete collection of minimum models comes into the game. That's because you're also looking at non-unitary models. Yes. Apparently. Yeah. So, so somehow in, in that particular picture, it seems that the, the minimal model thing is not crucial. It's sort of using, focusing or using, exploiting some other aspects of this. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, so it's harder to read. OK, maybe Evelina will uh, comment on that when, when she will go into that. But sort of that's sort of the, the global picture is that this whole CLE percolation thing works for the continuum values. And so that the minimality doesn't seem to, maybe it has something to do more, you know, on the discrete side. Of course, you know, the, the, the easing model itself, you know, the fact that it's the only one for which conformity, well, essentially you know, one of very few ones for which the conformity invariance is actually proved, <coughs> is actually... Uh, another comment I want to make is that, you know, if you want to go all the way to Kappa, you know, the boundary case, one of the boundary case of these CLEs is the CLE8, which is the scaling limit of the uniform spanning tree because it is also one of these FK models when Q is going to zero. So, you know, you, you could also go to negative central charge somehow, uh, you know, when you go on the other side. So, do you need Q to be real in your approach? Uh, yes. Why? <laughs> why <laughs> uh, is we probably we're not clever enough. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, I, uh, Q, uh, you know, you probably like to work with uh, <laughs> probability measures. Uh, so, we, you know, when... when even you know, even if you do the the tricks, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, how they call these tricks when you just do coupling, uh, uh, Baxter. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, these tricks that relate to different models uh, uh, using you know complex weights and something like that. We we are sort of. Uh, but it's still early in the century. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that. That, that I, I mean, I can make one comment, which is uh, there's a lot of things we understand in the relation with the loops and so on, but uh, I, I always feel that collectively we're missing something in the easing model. Uh, something, it's just there, you know, it's, it, we're just missing it that, the, you know, a, a, a loop soup representation of the easing model that would be a cousin of your, you know, random current representations, uh, you know, by Poissonization of a certain way, because at the continuous side, you know, it's there. It's this collection of, of loops, uh, is a Poissonian collection of loops. And so, anyway, so that's just a little comment. Okay, I wanted uh, now to finish by mentioning, yeah, I want to mention one thing, which is that there's one uh, additional thing that we have developed uh, with uh, Scott. Sheffield and Jason Miller in the, in the last couple of years, uh, which is building on their, uh, I mean, Scott and Jason and Bertrand and a uh, uh, number of people's uh, relation between uh, uh, SLE and Liouville quantum gravity, uh, or what is called Liouville quantum gravity. So, so what I want to explain now is the following fact, is that if you take a CLE3, so now I'm going to just keep the outermost loops. So you're exploring a scale, what would be the scaling limit of a plus easing cluster. And now on top of it, you, I mean, you sample an independent Gaussian free field. And then you, d you define this object, which is this, you know, which one can make sense of. Uh, and uh, Bertrand uh, is, of course, uh, you know, started with the papers of Scott and, and Bertrand. You're just going to take e to the square root of three times the Gaussian free field, and you try to interpret this in an area measure. So, of course, you have to do some little renormalization because this is the Gaussian free field is plus infinity minus infinity everywhere. So this will, thing will be, you know, very much plus infinity half of the time, and then you are, so you have to do some renormalization procedure. But you can construct something which was a real random area measure. Uh, in that domain, independently of the CLE. Now you do what we said, one of these exploration of this object here. So you start exploring this from here. And each time you discover a disk, uh, 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 CLE loop, uh, you cut it out. Right? So, you do, so by doing that, you, you know, you're discovering 
in a one-dimensional time-wise, a uh, countable collection, because you bounce in countably many of, 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 of these loops, many of them are small, of domains which are concrete you know, domains with a boundary and the area measure inside. And now what you do is that you put on special glasses where you don't see the geometry of the loops, you just view these domains as equivalence classes of uh, 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 domains equipped with an area measure. Okay, so I'm not going to say time is running out, so I don't want to say more, but then what one can prove is that indeed this Poisson collection, this collection of loops, of, of domains that you discover is actually a collection of IID independently, identically distributed, what they say called quantum disks. So these are random domains that just come in, in an independent way, one after the other. And so that there's a way which is reminiscent of all the discrete versions of quantum gravity that says that uh, you are gluing, you know, you're looking at reconstructing your object, which is, you know, a, a planar map type decorated uh, by Ising model. You are sort of reconstructing it by gluing together independent stuff that you, you know, collecting, you have a sewing mechanism that in comes a one-dimensional flux of IID uh, stuff and you have an algorithm to glue them together and out comes this decorated CLE, uh, percolate, CLE decorated by an independent Gaussian free field. So there is something that again is reminiscent, that is placed only in the purely continuum world, but that is reminiscent of a number of the tricks that you know, showed up in the combinatorics of planar maps decorated by uh, certain type of planar maps decorated by the easy model. As a result out of this, there's a very nice formula, and then I refer to an upcoming paper by two of uh, our good PhD students in, uh, at ETH. Uh, so that's uh, Laurent, who's sitting over there, Ma Laurent Kola Schindler and Mathis Limkula, which is if you do the following thing you do take a CLE 16 over 3. And now instead of tossing a fair coin to decide if it's going to be plus or minus for each of these things, you're tossing a coin P1 minus P. Right, so this is sometimes called a fuzzy pots model uh, or fuzzy easing model or something like that in the literature. And then you're looking at what you obtain and then there are certain things you can say. So one example would be that if you take a half plane, so I start with this model with three boundary conditions, whatever that means. And, uh, and then you look at, you know, I take a boundary point here. Is there a path of pluses that you get out of there, there will be a critical exponent that comes out of there. And the value of this critical exponent now will depend on the parameter p, which is whether you p is plus or minus with probability p1 minus p. And you have an explicit formula. And this explicit formula, just write it down, not because I like formulas, but uh, uh, just uh, to give you one flavor. And this type of formula is a very different kind than the formulas we're used to because it has, this is typically a formula that comes from the quantum, you know, this planar map stuff, these uh, objects that are here. Yes. It's a beautiful formula, but I have no idea what A of P is. <laughs> what is it? The, this is the exponent, the one arm exponent on the boundary. So that's, I take a FK model. Just very concrete. I take an FK model Q equal to with three boundary conditions in the upper half plane. Okay. I color the clusters in plus or minus for probably P, one minus P. What is the probability that the origin is in the plus clusters that goes all the way to distance R? Okay. This will be R to the minus A at first order. That's, that's this exponent. And this exponent depends on P in that way, which is a very, you know, it's sort of crazy that one can get the dependence of P, and that is sort of a, something that is, uh, I mean, the formula comes, was in the continuum in the paper with uh, Scott in 2021, with Scott and Jason, and they, what they sh managed to show is that indeed, you know, this, using the scaling limit of the e easing model things, that indeed, the statement I gave you in terms of the discrete FK percolation uh, model is actually correct. And this is typically, this is just to illustrate the fact that this is a formula that 
apparently, I mean, I have no clue how you would end up with a formula of that type unless you use this coupling with this additional, you know, uh, decoration story. So this is sort of at the heart of how to get this type of formula. This, that was just uh, something. Uh, okay, I am sure I forgot to say what uh, number of what I was planning to say, but I should stop to give the right uh, example of not being too much over time. Well, I start a bit late, so yeah. thank you. I would like to understand the relation of your approach to field theory. Yes. Can you construct a conformally invariant random distribution which would have scaling dimension 1, 8? Yes. I mean, that's, that's that. But that thing doesn't seem to depend on x. So where is the x dependent? <coughs> what do you mean x? Well, it has to be a field. It has to depend on, on the position in space. Yes. So. That would be the global magnetization. No, no, I don't no, want but, global. No, no, exactly. But what I mean is that the local one is, okay, the, the, you have these random fractals, okay? Now, once you have these random fractals, you can say, what is the probability that x is in the epsilon neighborhood of this random fractal? That will decay when epsilon goes to zero. That's the, what the dimension of the fractals tells you it's going to decay like epsilon to the power 2 minus d or times this, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, decay like that. Now, when you try to look at the limit when epsilon goes to zero of this thing, like what is the probability that this point is a random fractal, this point is a random fractal, and that point is a random fractal. When you have the limit when epsilon goes to zero, this sort of renormalized thing, you end up with quantities that correspond to what you have in mind. Right? So it's a little bit when, you know, the... Yeah, so that's, that's sort of the, the way to look at it. So what your field would be, typically, would be the Dirac mass at point, you know, it would be, you know, the, the d-dimensional Dirac mass at point x, where the Dirac mass is am I in that random cluster. You see what I mean? Instead of having a Dirac mass at one point, you'd sort of spread it in the cluster. The field I have in mind is not a Dirac mass. It's a, it's a continuum field. It's like phi to the fourth like field, which is... That's exactly what I'm telling you. But, but, because it's, it's a, but what I mean is that the way to interpret it here is going to be that it's going to be localized on the... On the you know, it's, it's epsilon i times something which is localized on these fractal objects. And so then the correlation function between phi x and phi y would exactly be interpreted as what is the probability that, you know, if you know that both of them are in a big thing, that they are actually in the same cluster. Do you know the regularity, typical regularity of this random distribution? Well, I mean, uh, this is yes, because you have these sort of, uh, you know, what I said is that the, the interpretation of, is in terms of random fractals of this thing is a way to try to uh, you know, construct and get, get deeper into the regularity of these objects like that. So in some sense, it's going a direction which uh, was flagged you know, as being, you know, don't try to construct these fields uh, out of probabilistic things, concrete probabilistic things, because it doesn't work. Or, you know. But actually, in, in this particular case, of these two very specific cases of two dimensions where you can do this, you can sort of do this Euclidean field theory in, in, a, in a way. And of course, you know, it should not be surprising because it is a scaling limit or, you know, there's nothing new in what I'm saying in the sense that it's just that once you think these things are constructed, usually, you know, the, the correlation function that you, you would like to play with would be the scaling limit, appropriately looked scaling limit of the discrete correlation functions. And therefore, and the discrete correlation functions are interpreted as being in the same big clusters. So, so that's sort of the, the, the global picture. Having said that, I mean, of course, Clément and uh, Dima and uh, Kostya and uh, okay, I call everyone by their first name, they, they will, you know, they will explain you. Okay, now if you look at the the field having to do with uh, you know energy field uh, type uh, questions, you would you would uh, 
well, then the energy field, you won't say, well, this is you know, where the plus and the minuses are next to each other. So you have the local thing, but then the, you, have, you will start looking at maybe something having to do more to, with the interfaces themselves, which are you know, where the, how they do interact. The global, my, my global personal experience, I have to say, was that starting from there, you won't say, OK, now we piece of cake. You can construct all these things out of these uh, random fractal, and things will be more transparent. You can do the construction, but it will not be much more transparent because, because in some sense, it's, you have random fractals on the one hand. You say, we construct them, here they are, and you can interpret these correlation functions in the way uh, they are constructed. In, but in some sense, uh, describing a random fractal via its correlation, you know, via its finite, uh, via its correlation functions, in a way, is not the natural thing you want to do. It's something you want to start with uh, because from the random fractal perspective, you know, you first have to define them and you have to show that actually they have enough local regularity that they have something that looks like a Green's function and that you can then interpret in this and that way. And then in some sense saying that this is a complete theory says that that actually characterizes that the set of correlation functions characterize the random fractal. But we have constructed them in the first place. So you see what I mean? Uh, what, I, what I'm saying is that the the conformal field theory, uh, from the mathematician's point, from my point of view, let's put it like that, uh, you could sort of see how it relates to these random fractals there, but uh, they are not naturally, you know, the the first place you want to go to describe or once you know that you are talking about a random fractal, it's there. So, uh, yeah. It's, it's a little bit like uh, if I give you a set of correlation functions in a certain way, you can say, what is the axiomatic, is there a theorem that tells you this corresponds to actually a random fractal? Or a random field. Or a random field, or, yeah. And, and the question is, yeah, but if you want to view it as being a random field defined by a random fractal, uh, the answer is, well, I, there's no you know, uh, easy way to check looking at these correlation functions where there can be have an incarnation in terms of random concrete geometric things, which is the reason why, you know, physics, there was no need to go through that, right? Because if you're looking for the global magnetization and things like that, you know, you have it out of the correlation function, you know, the, the, all the moments and things come out of the correlation function, that's enough. So you don't need to, you know, there was no big motivation to go in that direction, which is probably why, uh, you know, SLE and so on took a long while. And uh, some people like Michael, you know, knocked our door, said, you know, please, can you tell us, you know, in a probabilistic way, uh, what is, you know, looking at sort of more geometric objects, what we could do. Yeah. So the easing model, of course, also has a fermionic representation. Yes. What happens with all this formalism <coughs> if you look at models of fermions? Well, that's that's exactly something where I think we are missing something. So uh, I, I, it's not. You know, there, there is this thing where you look at the, you know, this whole collection of loops uh, is, corresp you know, the overlapping two things, then you get the Gaussian free field, you say it's bosons and so on. But then this, how to decompose it, you know, what, what would be the natural way, you know, uh, involving, you know, signs and uh, complex numbers that you want to assign uh, in these things, this is not, this is a, a place where, uh, piece of the puzzles that either is not there or is missing. Uh, so in my view, uh, on the continuum side. So you know, you, you understand well the, the, the uniform spanning tree, which is even more, you know, two copies of uh, Gaussian free field. So that's even more, uh, okay, Rick is here. This we understand well, but you know, go be below C equal one, ha C equal one on, on this uh, picture here is, is a bit uh, for, for fermions is a bit uh, tricky. We don't, I, I, I feel I'm, um, there's something I don't understand there. Ah, Michael? About the piece of the puzzle that you mentioned, yeah. that could part of it be, be found in the cuts world, the amplitudes, because an early picture of loops, in a way, is behind the uh, cuts world approach to the exact solution of the easing model. And there's a fantastic integrability in the, the general uh, Lagrangian sense yes. expressed by those loops. If 
the, the total amplitude for a closed loop is a real number, but for part of it is actually a complex number. Yes, yes. Uh, my, my personal experience is uh, whatever you suggest will turn out to be correct <laughs> in some way. Uh, but I, I uh, haven't been able to make it work. Uh, let's put it this way. Um, yeah, there's a... Uh, one, one, one little comment as well, is that just one comment, is that one, one tool that was of course essential in the whole study of the easing model over the years, which has to do with the transfer matrix approach. Mm -hmm. uh, once you are on the continuum side, it gets very awkward, right? Because you have the, you, you would say, you know, I, I want to cut this here and know what is in information on the line and how to, you know, move it forward uh, here. And you have this infinitely many, you know, plus minus things where you have to keep track of even odd stuff. You know, you have plus infinity and minus infinity canceling out everywhere because, uh, you know, it's a continuum of things, but still, you know wh what is even and what is odd. And so, I just want to say that you know the transfer matrix stuff uh, hasn't been made to work uh, on the continuum side, or attempts have failed. Uh, people haven't been clever enough uh, to 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 try to you know uh, understand this sort of uh, you know, moving this yellow line from left to right and try to understand what the dynamics are and what is the information encoded here. Uh, I mean that was just a, another comment of what of the wonderful thing that works in discrete case and what can enable to control the scaling of it and that in the, in the continuum incarnation is very difficult to actually describe. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe let's thank the speaker and have 